And uh, after the program, we'll have a book signing. So you can get a copy of this book and other ones through our wonderful bookseller. The word it out is back there, so go ahead and pick some hot copies up. Also in the back, by the cookies and water, you may have seen it, but if not, we have a flyer here with all of our programming, both virtual and in person. And there are new ones coming up that I'll mention here. So pick this up for May or go on hudsonlibrary.org to see our programming. Speaking of programming, we have two in person. Uh, Tuesday, May 16th at 6.30, we're going to have Richard Munson. He's going to talk about Tech to Table, 25 Innovators Reimagining Food. Another one that's in person is going to be June, Monday, at 6.30, we're going to have New York Times best-selling author, Kate White. She's going to talk about her newest book, Between Two Strangers. So check those out. So let's welcome our author here. So tonight we have S.C. Gwen. He's going to talk about his newest book here, his Majesty's Landship. And he has a bachelor's degree in history from Princeton University and a master's degree in writing from John Hopkins University. <laughs> He's the author of many such books, such as The Outlaw Bank, Kings of the Republic, The Rebel Yell, The Perfect Pass, and Empire of the Summer Moon, which is a fantastic book, and that one or was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He spent most of his career as a journalist, including Stinks with the Time as Bureau Chief, National Correspondent and Senior Editor with Texas Monthly as Executive Editor. He's also written for such publications as the New York Times, Harper's, Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, California Magazine, Boston Globe, Dallas Morning News. So let's give a welcome to S.C. Quinn. Thanks. It is a real pleasure to be here in the capital of the uh, of lighter than air uh, industry in the United States of America. And one of the centers of airships globally in the years that I'm going to be telling you about. I mean, I think you, most of you probably know this already, but if you don't, yeah, Akron is absolutely one of the places in the world where the significant things in airships were done. So um, it is, uh, and, and, it's, and I devote some significant space in my book to that. And we'll get back to that. Um, put that on my clip. Okay. Um, the, uh, so on October 4th, in the year 1930, an airship slipped her mast in the town of Cardington, which is about an hour north of London. Her name was a very plain sounding R101. R for rigid, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but she was anything but ordinary. She was enormous, two and a half football fields long, and more than 10 stories high. She was at that moment the largest object that had ever flown in human history, larger by volume than the Titanic. She held 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen gas. And she rose into the sky that evening, October 4th, 1930. She looked like a giant silver fish sort of floating in the, you know, the, the seas, the gray seas of the sky. And to the 10,000, tens of thousands of people who saw her do this that night, there was something completely implausible about it. A 777 foot long ship, this is, you can see how large it is, this is London just below here, but a 77, 777 foot long ship um, that was lighter than the air in which she floated. So inside R101 was a world of luxury absolutely unknown to the world of aviation and air travel of any kind. So uh, here we're looking at a 60-seat Art Deco dining room, uh, pillared and trimmed in light golden Cambridge blue. Um, this is the, uh, the lounge, this is the cocktail lounge, and beyond it you can see the promenade with the, with the kind of plastic celluloid whatever windows, and that's the promenade from another, from another view. Um, it also had a smoking lounge, <laughs> really interesting, at a 5.5 million cubic feet of packaging. Literally, they were, they were puffing on their whatever pipes and, and cigarettes just a few feet below the billowing middle gas bag in the airship. <laughs> Uh, uh, actually, and, and actually, we go back a second here. You see these pillars; they look substantial. In fact, the whole look here—it's supposed to look like a kind of a cross between a Pullman car and like an admiral's quarters on a steamship or something. But it's all illusion because this is lighter than air. That's balsa wood, linen. These walls—those are those are linen, thin linen. 
you know, the, the, the pillars, uh, this doesn't exist. It's all in, of course, wicker, very, very light wicker chair. Um, anyway, no one had seen, my point is no one had seen anything like R101 before. Um, and, but you know, it, it was more than just a physical form too. It was, it was, um, it was an idea. R101 was an idea too. It was an extravagant idea about the future of air travel in the world. And that night, uh, the, the fateful night, the night in question, she was embarking for India. And uh, on a 5,000 mile single stop journey over some of the Earth's most hostile terrain and that no one had ever made before by air. And just as important as doing that, that remarkable journey um, to Karachi, which was back then was in India. Um, she was going to do it in a fraction of the time. And this was the point of airships. We'll get into it later on. But airships, airships could travel long distances, short distances didn't matter much at all, long distances faster and better than anyone. I'll give you an example. Ocean liners made the passage um, from, let's say, London to India in a little over two weeks. R101 could do it in four days. Uh, it was a complete shift in travel time. And that wasn't because, you know, R101 was so fast. I mean, this big lumbering 77, 770 foot thing. It, but it could go for 65 miles an hour and it didn't have to stop. So there it is up there, 1,500 feet, oh. droning along for 24 hours. It, on the way to India, it had to stop for fuel once. So that was how it could be done. So R101 was going to revolutionize global air travel, and that's the sort of background of the book. And her voyage to India had, had largely been hatched in the mind of a remarkable man named Christopher Birdwood Thompson, who's sort of the hero of the book. He was a man of empire, he was one of the, one of the most prominent families in the Indian Raj, you know, five generations people in the Raj. He himself was a very successful military person. He spoke four languages. actually spoke French better than anyone in the British Army. So at the Treaty of Versailles after World War I, he was the guy out translating for everybody. Um, he was also Great Britain's Secretary of State for Air, which is a great kind of Shakespearean title. Um, and he came up with it, and he was the driving force behind a visionary plan that was, became known as the Imperial Airship Scheme. And the idea of this plan was that the, Thompson was going to populate the world of the British Empire, which was very large, um, with airships. They were going to be the, 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 they were going to vastly shorten the distances between these far-flung places. They were going to do it safely, and they were going to do it in, in an era where airships were very noisy and, and you'd get oil splatters on you and they had to stop to refuel all the time. Um, this, was, this was what the future was going to look like. Um, and, and it was going to be, not, and not just one of them, I mean R101 was going to be the first one uh, along with a sister ship, but it was, um, that's just a picture, of, that happens to be a German ship, but I mean sailing serenely through the skies of Earth. Our um, 101 is the first piece of that vision. My book is about how all of that went horribly, disastrously wrong. And how it led to the crash of what was then the most sophisticated flying machine in history. An event, by the way, that happened, and this is because for, for many of you, this is going to be your reference point, and it was certainly my reference point when I started this. Um, in 1937, an airship crashed in Lakehurst, New Jersey, called the Hindenburg. And you all know it, and I know it. And the reason we know it is because there was 30 seconds of film, filmed by a company called Pathé, that captured what hydrogen does when a spark hits it. It's astonishing how, if it, you've all seen this, right? It, and in fact, the reason you, one of the reasons you know about it is, well, there's that film, which at the time was shown in every movie theater in America. Everybody saw that. That was the most spectacular thing ever filmed. And uh, except there was no sound to it, it was just silent. Now, on the other hand, there was a guy on the other part of the Lakehurst airport who was an AP radio guy. And he was saying, oh, look what's happening, oh my God, the humanity, that guy. But he wasn't, you know, there was a, when you saw it in the movie theater in 1937, you didn't hear that, okay? Some enterprising British producer in the early 60s married the two together. And so what you and I have seen is the sound 
uh, the astonishing call on the radio combined with the astonishing thing. Anyway, that's, so that's the reference point, and to some extent Hindenburg over, has kind of overwritten this story and other stories, but um, my, this airship also crashed, and not this, let me get rid of this, air, not that airship, let's get back to my airship. This airship also crashed, and I'm not spoiling anything for you because on the cover of my book it says the life and tragic death of R101, okay? And that's, there's no spoiler here. It does go down. I'm not going to tell you exactly how it went down, but, but so it goes down seven years before Hindenburg. It's more lethal. It's a much better story. The Hindenburg was, the real story with the Hindenburg is what made it go boom. This is a story of empire, complex story of, of, of the kind of beginning of the end of the British Empire. And this story has the kind of great benefit of being almost completely unknown. Um, there are very few people who know, everyone knows the Hindenburg story. I won't say nobody, but it's a very small subset of people um, know about this story. Okay, so, so before, I, before I sort of get into this, I need to tell you a little bit about the background because you can't understand that thing in you unless you understand where it came from. <coughs> because it isn't a blimp, and it isn't a balloon uh, with a propeller. <laughs> And it's actually one of the strangest and most compromised and least practical and most dangerous ideas humankind ever thought up. In the year 1900, a short, bald German nobleman named Count Ferdinand von, where is he? There he is, von Zeppelin, invented a lighter than air flying machine. His machine was called a rigid airship and it was unlike anything that had ever flown before. So balloons, the original lighter than air concept, had been, been invented in the 18th century. And basically you put, you know, you filled a, a, an envelope of some kind with hydrogen or, uh, or hot air and it went up, which is actually a total miracle in a world governed by gravity where everything else goes in the other direction as this particular thing goes that way. Um, the problem with the balloon uh, is that it, I mean, it went, when it went up it sort of went wherever it wanted to go, wherever God or the wind wanted it to go, that's where it went. Um, you could tether them and use them as observation balloons, which they did in the Civil War and the Crimean War and other places, but you couldn't steer it. Anyway, in the 19th century, the French improved upon that by putting a propeller and a rudder. Um, and, uh, and successfully, you, had, you suddenly had a steerable balloon, a balloon that could actually fly from point A to point B, and if you were lucky, turn around and fly back. And the French verb, to, to, meaning to steer or to direct, is diriger. And the, the, uh, something that was steerable or directable was a dirigeable, uh, dirigeable a dirigible, steerable balloon. Um, there was another problem with balloons or blimps, and blimps are really just a larger form of a of a balloon. They may have a rigid keel at the bottom, but they're not, but they're, you know, you pump them up full of air and they go up, and if you took the air out of them, they would collapse. <clears throat> but the, so, the, so, and this is the problem with those things, is that they tended to collapse upon themselves, so they have a, a size limit. And because they have a size limit, the amount of stuff, human or otherwise, that they could lift was limited. You, you couldn't, you know, you, when you see a recreational balloon go up, I mean, that thing can maybe lift three people in the straw basket, that's it. If you had a balloon twice as big, it could lift six people, because that's, that's how it works. Um, von Zeppelin's new airship solved that problem, and this is the first one. Uh, this is just absolutely, I mean, nobody's seen anything like this before. This is the year 1900. This is Lake Constance in Friedrichshafen, Germany. And this thing is about, as I recall, 430 feet long. I mean, just crazy large for the time. Filled with hydrogen gas bags. Um, it, you know, the people were down there, you can see in the little car, and, and little, the sort of engine, engine car propellers front and back that made it go. Um, it was a prototype, it crashed immediately. Um, a lot of his things, a lot of his early ideas crashed. Um, uh, his machines were large, but they were virtually impossible to fly. They crash landed, they got beaten to pieces by wind, they blew up, that was another little problem you have with hydrogen. Um, and the count was actually mocked and derided as a crank. I mean, he was, people said, you know, you're nuts, this is what, we, these, I mean, they're, they're, they were, people saw this as ridiculous. 
And then something happened. So this one was going to be his real shot at the title. It's called LZ4. And this is a much more sophisticated one that was just up there, even though you can't tell. <laughs> it just looks like a giant flying pencil. But it is a giant, it is, it is gigantic. And this thing, these, this generation went up and was able to stay aloft for much longer periods of time. I mean, he, he stayed aloft, at, I think, in the, for 12 hours at one point. The immediate competition, the Wright brothers, is 38 minutes, just to put it into perspective. So, um, and, and then he took this thing up on what was going to be a 24-hour flight that was just going to show the world that this, is, this was it. He was going to go a round trip from point A in Germany to point B and back, 24 hours. And it was this very ship went up and it, it, it crashed due to wind. Wind played havoc with something that large and it, the wind kind of blew it down the landscape and then a hydrogen fireball consumed it and it went up and it was just a horrible thing. I don't, it, it wasn't, there was three people on board and they jumped off, but the point was it didn't work. And at that moment, you know, von Zeppelin's career should have been finished and, um, but instead of that, the German people, these, um, these airships touch something deep in, you know, German patriotism, nationalism, what have you, and instead of kind of canceling him, they rewarded him with a, a, a spontaneous $30 million GoFundMe campaign, which then allowed him to build more of these ships. It was strange, but keep in mind, though, this, uh, this, this airships had this weird nationalistic kind of side to them. The, the Germans looked at this as, look, he flew longer and faster than anyone else, and it was German technology after all, and so forth, and they, it was pride, national pride was caught up in them, as we'll see later, it will be in Britain too. Um, so, um, okay, so we have to stop here, and, and, and I have to explain to you, because this is, because when we get to R101, R101 is a Zeppelin in almost every way. I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a, the Count's machines were steel structures, right? Enormous steel structures with transverse frames and girders. And that was the difference, is that the, 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 Zeppelin, the Zeppelin could lift enormous amounts because of the steel skeleton, right? Inside of which you had the gas bags. And this is how R101 worked too. Um, so we have to stop here and consider what he was doing. Why did he want all this lift? I mean, the whole point of something this big, and this was astonishingly big at the time, was it could lift a lot. Well, lift what? Did, was he going to do a passenger airline? Was he going to uh, start a cargo company? No and no. He had one idea and one idea alone for what this was going to be used for, and it was as a weapon, as a weapon of war. Uh, Zeppelins, which is what they were called, a word that entered the language in the early 20th century. Um, uh, they were meant to bomb European cities, to set the cities afire, to terrify their residents, and to bring military glory, glory to the fatherland. And the rest of Germany was perfectly in step. We are in the years before World War I now, where, which Germany is, is going to be an active part of. And, Germany is in step with this idea that we're going to, the Zeppelins would be used as weapons. In fact, there was a, <coughs> a song I quote in the book that German children were singing just before the war, and the one lyric went, fly, Zeppelin, fly, fly to England, England shall be destroyed by fire. Yeah, cute little German kids. Anyway, uh, but that was the mood in Germany, um, a martial mood. So in 1914, the year, first year of the war, these things fulfilled um, von Zeppelin's dream. They took to the air and they bombed Europe, seven cities in Europe. Most, England got most of it. England got you know, the, the, by far the brunt of it. They came at night in the early morning hours, which meant that the destruction was not only coming from the sky, but out of the darkness. And, uh, and, these things became the world's first, um, first long-range bombers. They became the world's first weapons of mass terror. And they introduced mankind for the first time to the idea that it could, it could be uh, annihilated from above by something other than a thunderbolt. Literally, nothing else had ever done that before. Now you could look up and think that something was threatening you. Um, and when the war started, there was really no way to stop them. The British called them baby killers. 
Meanwhile, the German pro press wrote breathlessly about death and destruction all across England, massive explosions in British factories, a million troops kept from the front just to battle Zeppelins at home. It was very glorious. And unfortunately, most of that was completely untrue. Um, the Zeppelins did kill some people, and they did destroy, actually the total number of people killed was equivalent to what one torpedo did to the Lusitania, but just to put it into perspective, did kill some people and destroyed some property and certainly terrorized, I mean the terror was real, terrorized millions of, of people. But these machines were not up to the job of precision bombing in the dark, and they just weren't. They got blown off course, they were hugely subject to wind with such a large surface area, hard to navigate, their engines failed. Um, they were, uh, and they were, and they, they were so hard to navigate. In fact, that you know, you there, one night a squadron of five of them couldn't find London. I mean, just l largest city on earth. I mean, couldn't find it. They, they, they had all these these troubles, um, and a lot of their bombs just went down in farmers' fields. I mean, they thought they were bombing something, but they weren't. They didn't even know where they were bombing. And so many of the f bombs landed in farmers' fields. In fact, that the British began to believe that they were trying to destroy their agriculture. Um, and there's something to me that I find grimly comical about, you know, the, the German bomber, and literally they were, this was, you know, that's, that's what they were doing, you know, dropping the bomb and then you know, laughing exultantly at the horrible destruction of property and human life down below when all he had done was hit some melons and a donkey. It happened all the time. Um, but this was just the beginning of the Zeppelin's troubles. The real trouble came when the British figured out that you could shoot a type of bullet, which is called an incendiary bullet, which had a little phosphorus or something else in it. And if you've ever seen a tracer bullet, uh, you can see it go, because it's got a little incendiary component on it. If you hit one of these things with a couple of million cubic feet of hydrogen with a tracer bullet, they went up in very entertaining ways. Um, and it came to define the conflict, the battle against Zeppelins, because the Zeppelins, as the British figured this out with their fighter planes, the Zeppelin technology, the Zeppelin company in Germany, you know, advanced its own technology to and stripped out weight from these things so they could go higher and higher and higher, and, the, and it was this technological war. And so you had Zeppelins that could fly at initially you know, 10,000 feet, then 12, then 14,000, then 16,000. The British fighter planes just behind them coming up to try to shoot them down. And the British fighter planes always succeeding eventually in catching them. Let's see if I have this slide up here. So this is an extraordinary, there's hardly any photograph of this phenomenon exists. And by the phenomenon, I mean Zeppelins falling from 15,000 feet, looking just like the Hindenburg, by the way, except a nice slow motion version coming down, quite spectacular. But there are hardly any photographs that you can see exist. However, this is an actual, this is a photograph. It's London, it's night, and it's the moment when searchlights have converged. They found the Zeppelin, they found it up there. There it is. And now momentarily, I don't, I don't actually know in this case of this picture, but normally the, the fighter planes would be unleashed against the thing. And then it would go higher and higher and higher to try to get away, and, and, there, and that's what would happen. This was a British wartime poster um, showing you know, what one looked like coming down. And if you can read that, it says, the end of the baby killer. Um, Anyway, th so the point is that the, the, the bottom line here is that Zeppelins, from the beginning of von Zeppelin's test pro prototypes and test aircraft, they, were, they crashed very frequently. In World War I, they went down at astounding rates. I mean, there were like 50 of them went down that way, and then another 25 were you know, smashed to pieces or burned in their hangars. I mean, they were a terrible idea as a weapon. They didn't work. Um, and, <coughs> and as so the war ends, and, but the crashes now continue in peacetime. These things, th th there's, there, there's trouble with them. Um, trouble meaning they're extremely subject to wind of any kind. A, a wind near the ground is, tends to bash them to pieces. Um, uh, many of them ended up flying backwards in, into a headwind. And I, now, and so you have, we have this technology, it's a flawed idea, okay, you get that. 
Um, I don't want to paint that it is, is entirely a flawed idea because there were some remarkable moments of success. Um, the Germans actually ran a kind of a fake airline uh, before World War II, uh, World War I, where they, they had relatively modest sized Zeppelins flying only in summer and only in fair weather and only in largely windless weather and only on short hops and usually for freebies for the riders. But they kind of created an impression that they had an airline. Uh, but the real achievement that really kind of sticks out, and it's amazing that it's been lost to history, is in 1919, the British who had been struggling to follow the German technology, and they, had just, they just couldn't keep up with the German ability to build these things, the airships. The British would find one that had gone down, the engineers would crawl all over it, and then they would imitate it. Except that by the time they built it, they were years behind the Germans, and this kept going. I mean, the Germans had... Um, I don't know, 150 uh, Zeppelins in the, built in the war. The British had se seven. Um, but in 1919, the, the British had actually, they, in one of those ships that had gone down was one of their big height climbers. You know, they called them height climbers because they go really high, like 20,000 feet or above. And they had found a down height climber. They'd imitated it, and they had this airship at the end of the war. But the war was over, so there was no war use for it anymore. But they had this great piece of outdated German technology. They had a great pilot named Herbert Scott, a great old-fashioned um, seat-of-the-pants flyer. So they decided they were going to fly it across the Atlantic, which is an astounding thing to decide, considering that no one had done this before. And so our, let me see if I have a, a slide here. Of a, yeah, there's our 34. So very primitive looking thing. I mean, this is, this, everybody in it is in that control car up there like 20 of them in there. And you can see the little, the, the engine cars slung, right, slung beneath the hull. And you can see that it is, it is that form of the Zeppelin, right? It's, it's the metal frame with thin cotton linen draped over it uh, with the giant gas bags inside of it. Anyway, they flew this thing across the Atlantic. It became the first east-west crossing in history in history, eight years before, Hindu, uh, before Lindbergh. Lindbergh, by the way, went the easy way, which is west-east. There's a first east-west crossing, um, a horrendously dangerous thing. They, they almost ditched any number of times. It was just, it was a miracle that they made it. And then they got to New York, and then they turned around, and they came back, making it the first double crossing ever of the Atlantic. And so the question, you know, it begs the question, it was so heroic and it was so astounding that you could do this. This was across the Atlantic where, where you know, failure meant death. I mean, out in the middle of the Atlantic, if you went down, that was it, um, just as it would be with Lindbergh um, later on. But the question is, why don't we know about that? I mean, why, why don't you all know about Herbert Scott, Scott of the Atlantic? I mean, it's, and my answer to that, and this also answers some, to some extent why you don't know about R101, is because subsequent events overrode it. Lindbergh being the main one. Um, I mean, what Lindbergh did just took everything else out. I mean, you, you guys probably, most of you don't know who Alcock and Brown e uh, were either. They were the ones who won the prize for the first crossing of the Atlantic. I mean, Lindbergh got rid of them from, from history, from the popular imagination. And um, anyway, another by incredibly bright spot, right? He was saying, my God, they flew this thing across the Atlantic back in 1919, eight years before Lindbergh. So I don't want to say that everything always crashed, because you're going to get that impression the more I talk, because so many of them crashed. Um, and as I say, that's the, <coughs> the, uh, the exception that proved the rule <coughs> was, was the R-34. German ships had gone down by the dozen, British ships had crashed, American ships had crashed. Um, so this should have suggested to any sane and rational person that airships themselves were, were an, a bad idea, an impractical idea, at least what they were trying to do with them. They were too difficult to fly, too slow, too clumsy near the ground, too difficult to moor, too dependent on fair weather. They were unique in their ability, inability to land in a storm. They were built from ultra-fragile materials. Um, again, the gas bags were an, literally made from animal membranes. They, they were covered by a thin layer of cotton or linen. Um, they had a pronounced tendency to blow up. 
And when they did, they all looked just like what you saw in the Hindenburg footage. Um, moreover, by 1925, only a single air, rigid airship, now this is what, remember, these are rigid airships, that's different other type of airship. By 1925, there's only a single rigid airship flying in the world. So, meanwhile, at this moment, air, airline travel, airplane travel is expanding exponentially. Um, so it is remarkable that just exactly at this moment in history, and now I've given you the background, that Lord Thompson and his cohorts decide to launch the glorious imperial airship scheme to fill the skies with British airships. Um, and so the question is, why would they want to do that? Uh, I'm just in the basis of evidence. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you put your um, resources into something else, like maybe, you know, wing lift or something? On, and what they used to call heavier than air. Um, the answer to why they did it was in a single word, empire. And uh, after World War I, Br Great Britain held the largest empire in human history. I mean, the British Empire, the British after World War I, were, their, their power had declined significantly. Things were very shaky. There were revolts going on all over the place, you know, Ireland and South Africa and India. I mean, there were Iraq. Um, their empire was shaky, it was wobbly. But they still ruled, ruled, you know, they held 400 million people in a quarter of the Earth's landmass. So the new generation of imperialists thought they needed some new way to think about this huge and unwieldy empire that they had, some new way to comprehend it. And so they looked to long range flight. Now at this point, it, it really had not been proven. Um, completely proven anyway, that the airship wasn't a better long-range option to fly. Airplanes just were really tough. I mean, you know, when, when uh, uh, taking an, uh, an airplane to India was 12 really difficult days and 20 stops and it over, you know, just getting pounded to pieces. I mean, it didn't seem like they were going to do it. So people said, well, you know, maybe airships can do it. Um, and of course, you know, I'm talking about how, how many airships crashed. Well, airplanes crashed with alarming frequency also. The number of dead in any given year in the early 20s was very high. Um, so this idea of long-range travel, so just to give you an example, when they, look, when they thought about their empire, let's look at Australia, for example. When the uh, premier of Australia was traveling to London for the, for the imperial conference, which they held periodically where all the empire people came together, the guy from uh, Australia took him just about a month to get to England. An airship could do it in 11 days, just to put it into perspective. I mean, it, theoretically, in other words, if, if you had, let's say, a regular airship service running to pieces, parts of the empire, London to you know, Johannesburg, London to Sydney, to Auckland, to Hong Kong, Singapore, Egypt, Canada, I mean all over the world, right? You, you suddenly shrink the size of your empire. The space-time, it, it, it messes with the space-time continuum. And they saw this as a way of kind of pulling the empire together. But just as much as that, they were, one, they were going to be British airships, they were going to be airships like R-101. But the skies were not only going to be filled with that, but the, it, the skies were going to be filled with British technology. It was going to be their technology, and it was the technology with which R-101 was loaded. And just a word on technology, if you think about the British Empire, let's say in the 19th century, when it was the absolute colossal global superpower, I mean, it was based kind of on the greased piston, you know, the pounding piston, the ability to make engines better than anybody else, and the ability to make ships better than anybody else, and, and weapons. This, were, this was technology. This was just technique. And this had all kind of been called into question in, in the early 20th century. They were kind of losing their edge, and the Americans were by far the biggest threat there. It looked like they were going right by them. Um, and so a new world of the air all tied together with British technology was very much what this was all about. Um, and so they started to build the, the, the first ships of the, uh, of the airship scheme, R-101 being the main one, and, and they, the, their goal was to make it 
because of the problems that they had had to, to the safest thing that had ever flown. Just safety first, safety last, safety over-engineered. They made it four times as strong as it needed to be, the, the metal structure that held um, all of the gas bags. And uh, it would be built with five miles of stainless steel girders and tubing, six acres of cloth. And, in and, and this is what I have to tell you about now. I go back here. Okay, so let me go here first. There. Okay, this is R101. That's a gas bag. And to give you a sense of the scale, because you don't really have a sense of scale there, that is 10 stories high. And it is uh, filled with 500,000 cubic feet of hydrogen, which is astonishing enough. I mean, imagine ten, something 10 stories. You know, this is one story, okay? <laughs> imagine 10. That's how big it was, but, which is astounding. And, and uh, R101 eventually had 17 of these kind of lined up. I, I, I always thought they looked like cheese wheels. And you could like, see cheese wheels like lined up front to back inside this giant metal skeleton, right? So, but going back here, now, now this, is the, this is the more astounding thing though. These are the women in Cardington, north of London, build it, making the gas bags for R101. Okay, what those are made out of are uh, cattle intestines. Actually, a part called, of the, called the cecum of the cattle intestine. And so you and I would know these as sausage casings. Okay, we all know what a sausage casing is, all right? So they had 500,000 sausage casings. And they would spread them out, scrape the, they'd get them from Argentine slaughterhouses, spread them out, scrape the blood and mucus off them, cure them in all sorts of goopy stuff that stunk. The whole place stunk of awful and chemicals and everything else. And they would glue them all together, and then they would put a very thin cotton backing on them. And again, these were invented by the Zeppelin people too. Another, another this is coming directly from Count von Zeppelin. And so that that giant 10-story gas bag I just showed you, that's what it's made out of. It was so thin you could put your finger through it. I mean, people were constantly dropping tools through it or workers falling through both ends of it and out the other side. Um, uh, anyway, but this was the new vision. Oh and, oh, and you might, why, you may ask, <laughs> why are you, would you be using cattle intestines? And the reason is, is because hydrogen is the lightest element. Um, and hydrogen has a way of just getting out from wherever you put it. It just gets out. It's just very light. The molecule's very small. And they couldn't, no matter how hard the scientists tried, they eventually, actually, Goodyear eventually figured this out. Um, but uh, up until the time of R101, nobody could figure out anything better than cattle intestines. So, and the point of that was, I was saying, is that R101 was there when they were building it, they had this thing that is, is at once very strong, the steel structure, you know, and then incredibly weak, that, and, and thin cotton strips wrapping the whole thing. So the cotton, you have thin cotton protecting that, which has everything to do with what happened to R101. Um, and anyway, so as this went along and they were building R101, they, uh, they came to the, they started believing that it was indestructible and they kind of treated it that way, which harks back to two decades before the builders of the Titanic kind of started to believe the same thing, I think. Um, so, so confident were all the builders, by the, by the time R101 took off for India on that night, she had only the bare minimum of trials, only in fair weather. She had had terrible trouble with leaking gas bags that kept rubbing on the girders and breaking. Um, the cover had never been tested and it kept, kept shattering itself into long, 140 long strips. Um, so, so here's the, 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 the kind of the nub of the story is that on October 4th, 1930, Lord Thompson kind of insists that this airship fly to India before its time, before it was tested, and it ends in great tragedy. Um, but the question is, why would he do that? Why did he, um, why did he, as he's a cabinet member, he's secretary of state for air, he could do what he wanted to. He pushed it forward pretty much by himself. So why did he do that? Um, the first reason, um, and the main reason, was that in order to fulfill his vision, he had to demonstrate that it could be done. So now in the month of October in 1930, the Imperial Conference was happening in London. All the grandees from the empire were going to be there. 
And um, what Thompson wanted to do was leave on his great airship, the largest thing that had ever flown, fly it 5,000 miles to India with one stop in Egypt, turn around, fly it back 10,000 miles round trip, step off it, trailing clouds of glory, walk into the Imperial Conference and announce the new age of the air, which would be <laughs> to which would be attached a great deal of money also for new airships, bigger airships. And that was kind of the, you know, this is what drove everything. But there were some other reasons too why that thing had to take off on its ill-fated voyage that night. Um, uh, uh, the first was a woman. There's always a woman, right? Uh, if I can find them. Oh, these are, I'm sorry, these are some of the crashes. There's British R38, supposed to be the greatest thing ever in 1921. There's the uh, Shenandoah, uh, not too far from here. Ohio Thunderstorm did that one in. Um, oh, and there's a, a, you can see, this is building the, uh, the lounge, the cocktail lounge, and you can see the girders that exist inside the airship. This is, you know, they're, uh, those are the wicker, chair, wicker settees from the lounge, and you can see the girders behind them. Anyway, the woman. Um, during the war, Lord Thompson had been assigned to Bucharest in Romania as the military attaché, and he fell head over heels in love with the fairy tale princess here in Martha. And Martha had her own castles. Uh, that's one of them. There were two, she had two castles. Um, she was enormously wealthy. She was one of Europe's great beauties. She was also the, a celebrated writer who had become the toast of literary Paris. She's actually a good writer. And uh, Marcel Proust wrote her poems. Um, André Gide and Jean Cocteau were admirers. I mean, she was the thing. And Thompson, who was kind of a military lifer, was in love with her. But she, she was married to the prince still, but having affairs with very prominent men elsewhere in Europe. She didn't have much time for him. And this kind of story develops where Thompson, they're sort of in love with each other, but she, he can never quite have her because he's never quite big enough. She's, someone who is drawn to power, you know, like flowers are to sun, you know, she, eventually he becomes, he joins the cabinet and that, that solves part of it. But over many years he became ever more desperate to prove to her that he was worthy of her. And this leads us to the second reason that Lord Thompson wanted so badly to go to India that particular night. So unbeknownst to really anyone at the time, um, the Prime Minister of Britain, Ramsay MacDonald, had promised Thompson the viceroyship that offered him the viceroyship of India. Now, it's a really interesting concept, the vice, in the year 1930, the viceroyship of India. The viceroy of India ruled over 320 million people, of which 150,000 were British subjects. He lived in a 200,000 square foot, 340 room palace that was the largest residence of any, president, of any head of state in the world, and that was just the winter place. Uh, the summer place in the Himalayas was even cooler in some ways. Um, and moreover, he, to become, it was the most important job in the British Empire. And in, in 1930, to become Viceroy of India also meant that you were taking on the problems of India. India was seething, as we know now. I mean, in, India was going to f get its independence soon enough. But he was there, he was going to be there to save India for the British. And as I said, mentioned before, he, he came from five generations of, of the Raj himself. He was born in India. That's where he came from. So India plays in and out of this all over the place. But the other thing that, that, that R101 does is, of course, it, this magical compression of time. If, you can, if he can fly from London or Paris, let's say, to India in four days, suddenly those two are closer together. She can't marry him. I mean, the, the protocols, the social mores would not have allowed a, you know, a, a married princess who's having affairs with a you know, European princess to marry a, the Viceroy of England. That would never have happened. But R101 stitches them closer together. And uh, as much as R101 is, is, the, is the kind of the empire's airship, which it is, um, it is also Thompson's airship and the key to his own personal destiny. So they took off on that stormy night of October 4th. Um, Lord Thompson, along with 53 passengers and a crew for a destiny none of them expected. Um, and as the ship battled through a full gale, they dined happily in that luxurious dining room. They uh, probably went to the promenade and gazed out over the 
um, darkness of the English Channel, which would have been kind of a new idea. You're looking down at complete darkness. Um, uh, and just after midnight, R101's wireless operator sent a message back home saying, after an excellent supper, our, our distinguished passengers smoked a final cigar and having sighted the French coast, have now gone to bed to rest after the excitement of their leave takings. Everything was great. They're over the English Channel, they're heading to India. So I'm not going to tell you the details of the horrific fate because I, you're going to have to read the book for that. But um, the uh, it, it, in which uh, the passengers, of course, included Lord Thompson. He's flying in the ship in the cream of the British airship establishment and cabinet ministers and so forth who were on board. Um, I will note, though, that the British had, had not seen such an outpouring of grief. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a photo. You can see the, the very end there. But um, the, the British had not seen an outpouring of grief like this since the Titanic. Um, I, there were hundred, hundreds of thousands, you can see, hundreds of thousands of, somebody thought there was a million, but I mean, at least hundreds of thousands in the street. This is Whitehall in London. You know, for the, this is the funeral of the survivors, uh, the, funeral of the, survivor, the funeral of the victims. There were six survivors, which is why I can give you a, a really great account of how she went down. But um, those are the, the victims and the dead. Um, overflowing um, services at St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Cathedral. I mean, it was, um, there was something about R101 that kind of unaccountably tugged at British heartstrings. I mean, the grief was just way, you know, when you think they had just been through a war where, where 750,000 people died, uh, British people and subjects died, and this was a relative handful comparatively, and yet the grief was just so, there, but there was something about it, and, and, and there was something too about von Zeppelin's uh, experience, and it may have been in some way their size which should, of the airships, which suggested ambition suggested national ambition, suggested national pride. I guess there's kind of something, there's a little bit of fairy dust on that that I don't really understand. So um, I'll wrap it up in a minute here, but you'd think that R101's demise would have kind of put the end to airships. I mean, it should have. Um, it was like the best the British could do, and it didn't work. And, uh, but, uh, it wasn't over yet. Our airships were a very hard thing to kill. So in 1933, well, let's take this. In 19, between 1931 and 1933, a absolutely incredible piece of technology called the USS Akron, which uh, flew. And it was built right here. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it was, I get, uh, well, let's see, it started, it started to fly a year after R101 did, but it had, it was bigger, it had some more, more hydrogen in it, it had, uh, it had the, it was the first purpose-built flying aircraft carrier. You could put five Sparrowhawk fighters inside of it that would land on trapezes, and the British had tried to make that work, but the Americans sort of had. And Goodyear had solved that problem of the gold beater skins. They had filled it with they had uh, filled it with helium, which didn't explode. They had all this great technology like, um, that I won't go into, but I mean it was a it was a remarkable um, ship. And uh, but it what happened to it in 1933 off the coast of New Jersey illustrates well a couple of things about airships. One is how vulnerable they are to wind, um, and uh, and the other thing that illustrates is that they can't go down in a storm, which is a real problem. So a plane theoretically could land, you know, if the weather is bad, you would land to get away from it, and a ship could theoretically find a safe harbor to get away from a storm. But an airship is too vulnerable to wind to go down. If you go down in a 50 mile an hour when you get beaten to pieces, and then part of that will be a spark that will then, um, uh, if you have a hydrogen airship, uh, cause it to explode. Um, with the helium, of course, helium was not, w was not, um, was not combustible. But, um, so what happened was R-33 off the coast of New Jersey, I think it was in March, I'm sorry, well, I said R-33, um, uh, the Akron, uh, in 1933, off the coast of New Jersey, um, got caught in a kind of a, a, a cycle of thunderstorms. 
and tried for a number of hours to get out to avoid them and get out. Well, all sorts of horrific things happen. Thunderstorms with up and down drafts. When you have seven acres, in this case, of surface area, and wind, an updraft hits you, you go up like crazy. And they were doing tail stands and nose stands. And they, anyway, they ended up crashing into the Atlantic, killing 70, 73 of 76. Um, a sister ship called the Macon, um, a couple of years later, um, went down under uh, slightly different circumstances, although a victim of the same um, sort of wind problems that, that had taken the Akron down. Uh, two years after that, we have the Hindenburg. Um, and so you would have thought, okay, finally that's that, right? Okay, the Hindenburg should have, because one of the problems with the Hindenburg was after it had gone up in this giant fireball that everybody saw, the Germans kept insisting that everything was just perfect with it. There was nothing wrong with it. Nothing, nothing. We've looked at it, we've checked it, nothing wrong. And you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not getting on that ship. If that's perfect, and they have absolutely no idea what caused that. I'm not getting on that ship. Anyway, um, and so, but yet it wasn't. There was actually a, a sister ship called the Graf Zeppelin II, which was used for some, a few abortive spy missions, and then it was finally scrapped. And finally that was it, and that was the end of the era. And the era lasted 40 years up and down, and hasn't come back and probably won't come back. Um, and. Well, I was working on my book at some point, it became clear to me that while the subject of my book was nominally kind of Lord Thompson and his scheme to rule the world kind of idea, um, what I was really writing about on some level was just good old-fashioned human folly, but on a really gigantic scale. Um, anyway, thank you for listening tonight. I would be very happy to answer any questions. I think Derek has a, a yes, microphone. Yes, I have the microphone. Whoever have would like to spell. Questions. We got a first one. Yeah, do you have engine? Yes, there were. So let me see if I can point out, we'll go back. Um, the, so what powered them, see R101, okay, you can fall off and kill myself. Okay, so these little things here, these little things, those are engine cars. Each one houses a 650 horsepower uh, diesel engine. First time anybody ever put diesels up in the air. They, they put them up there because diesels, diesel fuel has a much lower flash point, um, or say higher flash point, um, and, and was thought not to, you know, if in the tropics the, the fumes would not ignite the hydrogen. But so the R101 had five of them, two, two, one, five, 650 horsepower, and they had these giant propellers that kind of made a clacking sound, clack, 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 as they went, as they went along. Where they the diesel? The diesel fuel was uh, stored actually in different places throughout the hull, and they had a very interesting kind of a pneumatic system whereby they could move fuel around, not only move fuel around, but they could actually use fuel as ballast, droppable ballast too. It was a very sophisticated, it's a good question. Uh, when the airship is in the air, you said they would elevate to escape the tracer bullets? Yes. Where did they get the gas to do it? Okay. So, this is a, it, so um, this is a little bit hard to explain. Uh, if you, if you let's say, if you have a big ship that's light enough and you have enough gas bags, and let's say you, if if you fill the gas bags full of hydrogen, you can't go very high because the gas will expand and that gas will have to be vented. But if you fill the gas bags halfway, as you, as, you, as you go up, the gas will actually expand and will have room to expand before it finally hits what's called this pressure height where it would have to be um, vented. The answer is how you go up is, is there's two ways that what brings the airship up is lift from helium or, or hydrogen and what, what allows it <coughs> And, the, and, and the, the lift is also controlled by ballast. They carry about 16 tons of ballast. So if they're going down really fast, they can throw ballast out. And what will happen is, is as they go higher and higher and higher, eventually they will have to vent hydrogen gas. And then they will drop some ballast to bring it back into, because um, at any moment, in order for it to float, the total amount of lift in those bags has to equal exactly the total amount of weight in the ship. And if you, 
drop ballast, then you're going to have to vent hydrogen. And that's, it, it's a very, that's why I hesitated. It's, it's, I go into this in my book. It's, it's, they were much harder to fly than airplanes, way harder to fly. And one of the reasons was the problems of lift. Um, because one of the things you could do with these things is, I mean, there were all sorts of things. So if the, uh, on, a, on a hot, humid day, they had far less lift than on a cold day with, with, uh, you know, with, a, with a high pressure system. If they flew in rain, it, she would gain 10 tons or 7 tons of weight just by flying in the rain. Um, for flying for 10 hours, she would lose, uh, she would lose uh, 5 tons of weight just by burning off gasoline. There was this constant thing going on of lift going up and down. But, one of the, but let's just say, R101 had flown in a very bad rainstorm and suddenly she was 7 tons heavier. Normally, you would just have to blow ballast. But these things could fly the way an airplane flies with Bernoulli's principle. So if she would nose up a little bit, five degrees, she could carry 13 extra tons of weight on there. Anyway, it's really complicated. I, get, I try to explain it in the book, but the idea is how much harder these things were to fly than air, airplanes, and, and your question gets at that. Um, but you can, you can basically go as high as your if your ship is really light and you have lots of hydrogen, you can go really high, basically. <laughs> anyway, hydrogen makes it go up. Huh? Because it was by far, hydrogen, oh, another good question. So uh, uh, give them the microphone. I don't know if anybody, everybody heard that. Why did they use hydrogen? Okay, that's a really good question. I, I probably should have gotten into it. So helium and hydrogen both lift, right? Um, helium is about half as efficient as hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is the best lifting gas. Um, back in the early days of von Zeppelin and the war, there was really no commercial helium to be had. The, the, such as there was, was located in the panhandle of Texas or in Kansas. I mean, it was in a container this big. There wasn't any. But as time went by, the helium began to be developed in the United States. Um, but the more time that went by, the more time that the more the Americans decided that it was a strategic um, element and they weren't going to share it with the Germans. And as time went by, the Germans wanted it more and more badly. And in fact, they wanted it for the Hindenburg. That was meant to be a helium ship, but we wouldn't give it to them. Um, the Americans, after a very bad crash in 1920, 1921, the Americans always used helium because they had it. But of course, all their ships crashed, so it didn't save them necessarily. But it was uh, hydrogen was used initially because it was just much more efficient than helium. And eventually, when everything had exploded so many times, they they they, they preferred helium but couldn't get it. The answer to that question. Hydrogen is actually very easy to make and yes. cheap. Pass. Helium was a back then at least was a very rare gas, and it was very expensive yes. to to. Uh, isolate it from natural gas, where it still comes from today. Right, hydrogen so was, was really easy. You could just sort of pass heat over me metal, and you know, and uh, and what you bring up, though, was a really interesting point because helium was really expensive in addition to everything else. And the only way the Europeans were ever going to get it was on these train cars in in, in propane like tanks, and very expensive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I wasn't, yeah, there's, there's so many things here, but yes, you could, you, not engines, but, okay, so the, the, here we have elevators, really, they're really huge, those things right there, that's the rudder, it's like 10 story high rudder, and uh, like six stories wide elevators, gigantic elevators. So if you just give it gas and elevators up, she goes up. Elevators down, she goes down. As I said, you could, you could bring her nose up five degrees easily, and, and that's so. So yes, she, she would get. But what allowed it to get there was the hydrogen, um, was the lift. It's a very complicated formula, and the the, the Germans were the only people. If to, to, co combining this ability to use elevator, and lift, to get the airship up and down was the, the Germans were the only people who fully understood it. Okay, we have time for one more question. Who wants to be that? Oh. Just all the uh, intrigues and the history and the side stories that you're describing 
Has anybody approached you about maybe writing a screenplay? Because I can see like an eight-episode <laughs> Netflix series here. People, people keep talking about that. It's, it, it, it's got that kind of feel to it, you know, the man with the dream and the beautiful princess and the, the empire at stake. Yeah, it's, got kind of, it's got kind of a sweep to it. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily see it as, a, as fiction. I see it as a, an incredible documentary because there's, there's plenty of photographs of this stuff. And, uh, um, I was just looking at one the other day. I was watching what happened to the Akron, uh, and I think it was here. I think it was in Akron that it happened. But you could see this giant thing, this 800-foot-long thing, swinging in the wind and bashing its lower fin. And, and in another case, you know, it just takes off. You know, these poor guys hanging on to the, to the ropes. But yes, it's, it's, uh, it's got the potential. It would be fun. I mean, wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> so... Anyway, okay. thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.